All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, let's uh, start with our vision and charge again. Um, okay, so we want to work cooperatively with town and community to raise awareness and achieve results with a sense of urgency. And in everything we do, we will put environmental justice at the forefront of our decisions. And I just want to highlight that we want to prioritize or try to prioritize exponential improvements and not incremental. Just want to keep that in mind uh, when we're doing anything for the community. Um, changes here from the last meeting. Um, I realized that uh, might have been in violation with the open meeting law. I did have two names per program, and you see that I've removed them. So I had a conversation with Stephanie. So what you see now are just you know one person per program, and you can still talk to your counterparts and get information. And Stephanie will talk about the open meeting law as part of the agenda. Um, so we can talk about that when we get there, but just keep that in mind that you can still communicate, um, but there cannot be a three-way communication. Um, and the other thing that I also added here is, um, is this new pillar on region and state legislative efforts, things that are going on in the state, that we need to be aware of. And so Andra is going to look beyond our CARP and bring in things that towns are doing, best practices, policies that are being um, passed. And so um, just get a different outside perspective that we can then look at and see what we could do to support. Oh, well, Sue, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you need someone to take the minutes. Oh, um, whose turn is it? Lori just finished. Mine. Andra. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andra. Yeah. So, any questions on this and why we only have one name and the extra pillar there? I think the extra pillar is a great idea. That was one of the things I was concerned about. So, I'm glad to see that in there. Thanks, Lori. I can't see any hands, so if you uh, okay, I can't see these. Hands. Okay, no comments. All right. Now I'll talk about my metrics. So participation. Uh, what I'm capturing here is kind of a month, uh, weekly. Well, well, whenever we have the meeting, I'm going to track my two goals here: one around the community participation in these meetings. Uh, we did have 20 people. Um, come to the last one, uh, that was exciting. We just need to sustain that and potentially have more people uh, when we have these education series. Um, and then from an education series is the other thing that I'm tracking. So uh, those are my two metrics. And then Lori, you also had in your meeting minutes and I really liked that you highlighted actions in bold. And so I, this is maybe a recommendation, uh, you know, anything that we talk about during these meetings where people say, well, I'll take the action or I'll look into it. Uh, maybe I can capture this and we can discuss so it doesn't get lost. Um, it doesn't have to be a priority. I, I don't know how to how we want to track this, but I just thought we're talking about it. Um, someone said they're going to take it on. And I just felt maybe I should just capture it. So it doesn't get lost. Is everyone okay with doing this? Yeah, I was thinking of the same thing. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, Stephanie, these are a couple of actions that you have. I don't know if you had a chance to even look into this, but um, this is something we can chat about at the start of every meeting, actions from the previous meeting or the ones prior. Yeah, and they're on my to-do list for um, tomorrow, actually. So okay. I, I have a list of things, and that's two of them, obviously. Okay, sounds good. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on to the next part of the agenda, which is uh, the minutes. So has everyone reviewed the minutes? Yeah, okay. Any questions or comments?
I move that we accept the minutes. Thanks, Andrew. I'll second that motion. Okay, if you could be sure to unmute, we'll do a voice vote. D? Yes, except. Goldner? Yes. Roof? Yes. Ragavan? Yes. Selman? Yes. Rose? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank you, everybody. All right, let's move on to public comments. Stephanie, can you open up the public? So if anyone from the public has a comment at this time, please electronically raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you so that you can unmute and speak. Okay, there appear to be no comments at this time. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the next part of the agenda and uh, talk about heat pumps. So, Lori? Okay, I don't thanks. Know if you so, want to share or Stephanie yeah, share. I, have, I have a few slides to share. I made a couple little changes. So, let me go ahead and share them um, by sharing. Let me just find it. Hang on a minute. Okay, heat pump strategy screen two. There it is share okay so you should be able to see this now right yes um because i see something different from what you see all right so um since this is the <clears throat> first time that we're discussing heat pump strategy um since sort of changing the way we do things i uh, with more better defined goals and <clears throat> action items <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought uh, we'd start just by um, going through the questions that Vasu posed and making a proposal for what this program ought to look like. And the first, the first item of business is to rename it because, as was immediately pointed out by both um, Steve, I think it was Andra and Jesse, uh, and maybe also Steve. I don't recall. Um, and that, as we discussed before, that there's no point in talking about heat pumps without talking about envelope improvements and other energy saving um, things that you can do in your home, energy saving and, and electrification you can do in your home. So I think something like residential energy or some a broader name like that is more appropriate, residential energy um, concerns or residential decarbonization or something along those lines. So I'll refer to it as residential decarbonization or residential energy, or at least I'll try to do that. Um, the program that ECAT can do is really one just of awareness of education and getting the word out and letting folks know what they can do and how they can go about doing it. Um, there are a few specific things that I think folks need to know about. One is the whole mass saves program and what it can do for you as a residential, as a, as a homeowner, or as a, in particular as a homeowner. Um, there's also the question of what residents can do to, to decrease their carbon footprint. And there it can be either renters or owners. Um, there's actually quite a lot of, I could imagine having a separate discussion sometime as, as part of our educational series, just devoted to what renters might be able to do on their own or to encourage their landlords to decarbonize. Um, and so one could imagine also having particular educational, educational seminars, workshops, programs on specifically on envelope improvements or specifically on heat pumps or specifically on some aspect of the technology or how you buy a blank, a heat pump, a, you know, whatever it is you're, you're looking for. Um, why this is important, it's important because omitting the colleges, which are already heading toward decarbonization, residential heating, residential um, carbon tends to, tends to be about 40% of the total footprint. I don't know exactly what it is in Amherst because looking at the 2017, um, it, it'd be interesting if somebody else who's maybe more familiar with it would have a look because I couldn't tell from looking at the 2017 inventory 
how much of non-university residential carbon in, in Amherst was coming from, um, uh, sorry, how much, how much uh, carbon was coming from residences outside of the university. Um, I just couldn't, I couldn't pull that number out, but it's generally around 40%. So it's a big chunk of the carbon that enters the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, uh, not to mention methane. So what can we do? Again, what we can do are educational programs. And so I brainstormed a little about what these should look like. Um, with, you know, again, I, I came up with a couple of ideas and sent them off separately to, to um, different folks in the, in the uh, ECAC. And what came back, I think, were, and, and this, is, this is where all of your input is really useful. You know, if you think we should do something else, if you think we should be, um, you know, we're just completely wrong, let's do something else. Let me know if you, if you have suggestions for people who can do these workshops, because there are going to be a lot of connections we're going to have to make to bring people in to help us with these, right? Uh, but the first program might be some sort of overview, for example, that talks about envelope issues, including rebates available for those or incentives available for those. It talks about how heat pump choices, how you pick a heat pump, um, that talks about other parts of the transition, maybe getting an induction stove or, um, or even if you're a renter, a simple thing like getting a um, induction hot plate right, an inexpensive induction hot plate just to get started on this road. Um, and also maybe as part of that seminar, have a physical output, some sort of a piece of paper or a web page or something that is a list of resources, as well as the recording and the slides, right? So that would be an overview sort of program. I think several of us really like the idea of panels. So for the second program, we were thinking of bringing in a panel of experts to take questions. Every house is different. Everyone, you know, RMI likes to talk about getting the low-hanging fruit, right? Pulling off the, the people who are ready to transition and getting them first because they're easy to get. But if you're going to get them first, you got to answer these questions, right? I have a problem with my home. How do I do this, right? So get the panel of experts together who can give uh, input to individuals, you know, can give a little bit of an overview of what they do and how they do it, and then take questions from the audience, right? And this could be somebody from Mass Save who knows all about the rebates and incentives uh, programs, a HERS Raider, who's somebody who really knows about what your home might need, how, how, to, how to understand your home as an energy system, right? As a, as a where heat is going, where you're losing heat and this sort of thing, where, where, you're, what, where your money is best spent. I guess that's probably a better way to say it. Um, and then maybe a local installer or someone with similar expertise um, if we can do that without creating an economic uh, or financial uh, conflict of interest, somebody local who can talk about what's involved in actually doing the, the um, install. Um, another panel might be residents who've already done the transition. We end up, we frequently talk about this here in ECAC, right, about our own experiences. Wouldn't it be nice to have a panel of three or four or five people who've done this, each in a different type of, coming from a different starting point, right? Talking about where their challenges were and how they solved them. And again, taking questions from the audience. It's a good networking opportunity. All of these are good networking opportunities to get residents connected. Um, and I think all of these are exponential in the sense that if you educate a few people and they make the transition, they can talk to other people about that, right? Just sort of the definition of exponential. And then they talk to more people and they talk to more people and it, it grows outward from there. So. Uh, you know, even if we only have 10 or 20 people attending these things, if half of them or a third of them or even a quarter of them actually make a change because of it, they're likely to influence their neighbors to do the same. I know that's how it works in my neighborhood. Um, and then there are other programs you might want to suggest, you know, other things that we can do, uh, something aimed at renters, perhaps something aimed at landlords. Um, okay, how do I get this to, there we go. Uh, so we don't have funding ourselves for anything, right? All we can do is get the word out. The partners we'll needed, we need for this sort of thing are exactly those that we need for these educational seminars. Who do we bring in, right? Um, leading and lagging indicators would be how many people attend the program, how many questions get answered, and ultimately how many transitions actually get made as a result of this. And that's hard to track. 
but maybe we can do something around a spread. You know, people can just just ask for their input if they do a survey. You know, we, we know who attends these things. We have their email when they usually when you sign up for the webinar, you have to give your email. So just send out an email blast and say, did you actually make a transition as a result of this? Or here's a little survey for you to fill out, you know, if you've actually made a transition because of these, um, because of these uh, workshops. Uh, the funding available is all rebates and incentives um, for mass saves. Again, it's not through us. How we'd implement it, I would imagine doing one of these every month at the, as we've been, as we just started doing last month. Um, if the format of the panels works well, I could imagine continuing this as a sort of a WMUA radio program or something like that. I know those guys are always looking for radio programs and you could imagine a panel of people getting on there every week and talking about uh, taking questions about the energy transition, just like you hear all the time on the radio. I know that station out of Albany has everything from gardening to medical advice over the uh, talk shows, right? So we could imagine putting something like that together that might be helpful. Um, I think one of the challenges that I mentioned on the next page is how we advertise this. How do we, if we're gonna implement this, we want people to show up, how do they know about it? And that's uh, possibly one of our weaknesses, but I think uh, that by using social media, by targeting different audiences, by maybe using, if we have a little bit of money we can spend on advertising, either on the local radio or, or on uh, in local newspapers, um, I think we can probably get the word out that these things are happening. In particular, if we, for example, are going to target renters, then there are all sorts of student groups we could be sending emails to, right? Um, so we can involve the students in this as well, if, if there's interest in that. Um, key milestones, let's do the event, right? The milestones are the events, I think. Um, and the sources of information that'll, you know, will, will be a combination of things, mass saves, the website, flyers, recordings of the events, and uh, who knows, maybe a radio show down the line. Um, we, you wanted a timeline, so the timeline just looks like, you know, one thing a month for the next few months at least, uh, one program a month. So what I need, um, what, what I'd like to ask for from people here today is your suggestions for, you know, do these programs look like a reasonable start? And I'll go back to that previous page. And who do you have? I have a list, a short list of people that I might, that we might contact, but who would be good presenters for some of these programs or for a program that you might want to see, for example, for example, right? So if you have questions for that, um, if you have good ideas for how to advertise these programs, and if you, um, know how to involve, uh, how to get people involved. You have good ideas for advertising. These are all things that um, that would be really good to get input on. Finally, I included a link here. I hope this will, I suppose, get added to the package for this month. Um, there's a link here on a very nice uh, book. Uh, a little, it's, it's fairly, it's a, it's a pamphlet. It reads easily, but it's a hundred page pamphlet and it has something in it for everybody, including at the back of it, really nice checklists for separately for people who are homeowners or landlords and people who are renters, what you can do toward transitioning your home. And there's all sorts of ranging from very, and there's prices associated with each of these, right? So from very inexpensive things like changing to LED lights to slightly pricier things like buying an induction coil uh, hot pad, uh, uh, burner um, to, you know, getting an electric car, right? It's, it's all in there. And there's a buyer's guide for most of these things as well. So it's a really handy little guide for almost anything you might wanna to do to contribute to decarbonization. All right, so that's all I've got. I would love to get people's input and thoughts on programs and names of folks to contact. Thanks, Lori. Any questions for Lori? Uh, yes, Stephanie. So maybe these might be more um, comments and input than and feedback than um, questions. And this will sort of cover some of my report further on the agenda. So one thing is that we do have ARPA funding for heat pump program. So 
This is really great. I mean, and I've I've been presenting that at the last couple of meetings, I've mentioned that. So the timing of this is really fantastic and especially important because, um, you know, we've, um, we, you know, the whole idea of really getting people to focus on sort of their envelopes first, the timing is really great because if we can get that information out now, this is the perfect timing to get people moving forward on their um, home assessments and getting the building envelope addressed now, you know, while we're sort of putting the program together because we do have to start launching this like within a year, it has to happen. So that's perfect oh, okay. timing and really great. Um, and I I've, totally forgot about that funding. So thank you, Stephanie. That's yes. Fun. So there's so and also as part of that, I've had an initial meeting with CET about potentially piggybacking off existing programming rather than trying to create our own so yes. that we would actually just be adding additional incentive funding to programs that already exist. Um, so I have a follow up meeting with them more to figure out how we would put that together and we'd probably have to do an RFP and put out a proposal to get a consultant to work with us but um, those are the initial meetings that I'm having but the follow up for that will certainly be something that I would want to work with you and bring you and Lori to some of the meetings with whoever it is we work with on this program of doing this kind of community outreach and they will have resources and we you know you're a committee of the town you know we have resources too yeah. so we can get you know the advertising about the workshops and all of that that's something the town can absolutely do um and and you know it's not we're not everything you know we're not the only um, avenue for that outreach but certainly we're you know we can help with that so um those are the the sort of top things I wanted to address and I want to give others an opportunity to give you feedback too. That's great. Yeah, Stephanie, I, I had the same exact question and I know you answered it on funding and I, cause I know we talked about ARPA funding. Um, uh, Lori, you know, you talked about the timeline for the three education series over three months. How does it look like after those three months end and we complete the education series and is it, I guess I just wanted to make sure that it doesn't get lost because we have this education series, let's say 10, 15 people show up and what happens after that, right? I, and maybe this is where uh, I think CEI or CET, um, uh, Stephanie, that you mentioned might be beneficial where you continue to keep that momentum going. I, I think there might be some value there. So the, the program that we have in place is going to be a three-year program. And also the other thing is I've been attending several meetings from kind of different source resource perspectives on the um, Infrastructure Reduction Act um, funding that's coming down the road. And so, you know, heat pumps are a big part of the funding that's coming through. So we don't know what that looks like yet. Mainly what's gonna happen is that the federal government will give the programming to, you know, the funding to the states, but the states have to create their own funding. And then it's sort of up to us to sort of help get that information out. So really the timing of all this is just perfect. And I, again, you know, I think some of this is, you know, exactly what we're gonna be looking to create over this period of time. and some of these questions might be answered and I think there'll be other resources to support us in this. So I think Lori has just provided a really great framework to sort of start moving that forward. And the, the, pa the panels and the events are, again, just really great timing and will work really well. And people don't necessarily have to, um, they don't absolutely have to do the weatherization before installing the heat pump, but you want it you know, you want them to be happening. You you don't want someone to install a heat pump and then it be like five years down the road that they do the weatherization. So even if you get the heat pump in, but within the year they have their weatherization schedule, that's, you know, I've, I've heard some various feedback from, you know, program consultants who have said, you know, you want to get heat pumps in and don't get stopped completely in your tracks by not having the weatherization done. Just make sure you get it done. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Andra? Um, yeah, um, three things. One about um, and, um, funding available from uh, local energy advocates for um, in 
an induction cooking library loan system oh. um, that's in motion and that could be a nice thing that um, could be you know a part of one of the residential decarbonization education um, programs um, and I think another thing that um, ECHC could do is um, help the town maybe with um, the Amherst Chamber to educate contractors because there's still a lot of misinformation out there and people call in a contractor and they say, oh, you know, heat pumps don't work when it's really cold. And we we need to get out the, the right information and a lot of people are gonna get the information not through our programming, but through the contractors. So I'd love to see us do something like that. And, you know, Obviously, there's partners that we could work with, um, including community groups, um, CET, others. Perhaps. Yeah, uh, and extension <laughs> energy extended. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. I was actually thinking about the low income community as well. I, you know, you bring you have these education series, but are they participating or coming to these? ECAC meetings, and I don't think so. So we talk about the people most impacted, and I, yeah, I, I think this is good. The education series is good, but I, I don't think it's the one solution. I, I think we got to think about other ways of outreach, and yeah, I, I'm not sure what that could look like. And um, I, yeah, I, I don't know if others have any thoughts. Um, Steve and then Stephanie. So uh, yeah, a couple of potential resources for you, Laurie. Um, one is a name, Matt, with a small consulting company called Powerhouse Energy. And I, I think, Jesse, do you know Matt? Um, you recommended and I, him, and I spoke with him about energy rating systems. And he does um, either HES or HERS. Um, he sounded pretty excited for the concept of improving energy efficiency. Um, I'm not exactly sure his background, but he, he might be a good person coming from sort of the building technology side uh, for a panel. Do you know his last name? I don't have that written down, Jesse. I, I Matt Turcott, he's a wonderful guy, Powerhouse Energy. I'll send you his contact. Okay, okay thanks. Um, the other note that I have in talking um, earlier this year with folks uh, over in Cambridge, they have a one-stop resource center to help building owners and residents to want to improve. And they use three different firms for the different types of buildings. And I, I think you're familiar with these um, abode for the smaller buildings, a group called new ecology for larger multifamilies and all in energy for other resources. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't have web addresses, but I'm pretty sure if you do a quick Google search, you can locate those. Um, and I'm pretty, I, I, I recall that you're familiar with at least two of those three. So those were the couple suggestions for ideas. Um, the only other one is um, uh, the retired, the guy who helped um, Hampshire College build the Kern Center. Um, uh, building. Jonathan Wright. Yes, Jonathan Wright, thank you. <laughs> he lives over in Northampton. He's a great guy. Um, Right, with an R or a W? W R I G H T. Yeah. It, he, he was one of the principals of Wright Builders, but he has, I believe, he has retired. But maybe a retired guy's a way to get around the, the perception financial. of um, yeah. financial. Yeah, financial. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. For um, purposes of the notes that um, Steve passed on all of these directly to. Laurie and um, Stephanie. Thanks. I did. I have been writing them down, but it's nice to. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm not getting them all in the notes. 
Stephanie? So um, I just attended an Eversource um, building decarbonization workshop that they had. It was an all day. Oh, I was um, but I, but yeah, I was only able to attend a few, but yeah. there were a few presenters in the very first session. And then there was one at the very end um, specifically about dispelling the myths of heat pumps. Okay. So um, I can get, I definitely have a link to the recordings and the names and I wrote them down in my notes, but I have five notebooks, so I can't grab it right this second, but I will get them to you. Um, but I thought that was a really, I couldn't go to all the workshops, but those few were really helpful. And it made, I wished um, that I could share the recording. I, I have to sort of reach out to them and see if I can, because I felt like the, the very first workshop was especially helpful. And, and that was about residential, um, you know, heat pumps, residential heat pumps for, you know, um, air source heat pumps, but also um, hot water yeah. heat pumps. So, and they were sort of talking about that technology and how you can use that for things like shared use, dual use. It can be used for radiant flooring as well as, you know, just general hot water use. So um, those folks, I definitely have some names and I can get those to you as well. Yeah, I have at least one name from that that I was impressed with, so. Um, but I didn't go to the end of the day session, so. Um, so I think maybe the way to proceed is um, to decide offline what the first, what the first, uh, supposedly two weeks from now, well, e either, either we'll be at the ECAC meeting or it'll be something that will tag on to something CET is already doing but we should try to aim for something in the next couple of weeks before the end of this month, right? Um, and I guess we can talk offline depending on people's availability to speak and what folks think the first one ought to be about, uh, something on the more general side, I would think. Um, we can figure out offline how, who's gonna do that and, and, and where and when. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I think so, Lori. And then uh, Stephanie is also making that connection between you and CEI as well. CET. CET. Yurka, you're talking about the possibility of a program at our next meeting in two weeks. Either at our next meeting or possibly outside of the meeting through CET, something that they're doing anyway that's right along what we're interested in. Yeah, we're not going to have that ready in two weeks. Okay. I mean, this is something that we're trying, we're going to have to work with them to identify, depending on what they come in with as a, a potential quote for services, we I might see. need to go out to bid. So, well, so that's going to take a little while. So I think you should just proceed with, you know, I think a general panel okay. of information. I mean, what is a heat pump? <laughs> people, I mean, that basic, people don't know. I think that whole idea of a heat pump 101 would be a great way to start. Um, okay. Is it something thing that I, we can connect with mass save, Stephanie? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. You know, I, I just think it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to get folks, but, you know, I don't see why not. And there are plenty of people. I, mm. I, some of this, I feel like we can sort of um, figure out offline. If you want to identify an organization, we can sort of do that outreach outside of the meeting. Yeah. I did want to say one really something really quick though that Vasu you brought up earlier about um, low income and and providing information to low income. One of the things I did talk to um, CET about was that this is a, a primary uh, demographic that we want to reach in our community with this heat pump program. That was mm -hmm. kind of the the main thrust. And so we were talking about like do you open it up to everyone? How do you do this? And what they suggested was that you open it up to everybody, but the outreach is really very, very specifically targeted to low income households and renters. And so that you can reach people um, more directly and you can sort of put all your resource, resources towards that effort because it's very likely the the other people are people that attend the meetings. You know, the people in the sort of other, you know, um, a fluent homeowner in Amherst is probably going to hear about this or have resources to connect or hire somebody on their own, you know, to help them with it. So um, the, the support would be to like w literally walk people right through the whole process. Okay, good 
to know Stephanie. Stella? I just wanted to remind um, Basu, you sent yesterday a notice. There's a Heat Pumps 101 or a webinar coming up on October 18th by the Green Energy Consumers Alliance, which looks like it could be perfect. Uh, it's Tuesday, the 18th, 7 p.m. And again, Thursday, October 20th at noon. Um, maybe you could forward that announcement to Stephanie and she could send it out to everybody. Um, yeah, that, that might be a perfect model to um, to use. And maybe we could replicate that ourselves for the we town. Promote, maybe we can promote that. Um, yeah, or promote that itself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Just Thanks. You. Stella, you were first. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm on a mailing list where this question of heat pumps comes up a lot um, for various reasons. And I was just going to suggest that the first panel really focus on like kind of to Stephanie's point, what are they? And also then people's next question is like, do they work? Like people just want to know, like, will they keep me warm? And like, what do they involve? Like very, very, very basic Um before getting into any of the rest of it because people like want to know they work. Yeah. The other thing, just like a reminder, I, I this may be a little bit like of a tangent, but I think it feels relevant um, to Vasu's point, like about low income people, like basically all of the college students are low income, regardless of whether or not they're like low wealth, you know, that might not reflect like their financial situation um in full like as a word but just like when we do have like just huge populations of like college students who are like <laughs> low income oh yeah functionally um I, I don't know what what to do with that but information but i think it it feels relevant i, I think that um it's best if we just talk about renters because the big difference in, you know, building decarbonization is between homeowners and renters. Um, yeah, I agree with that. It feels less like euphemistic too. It's more like, I think a practical, more of a practical distinction. Did Jesse, did you have something? No, I just I wanted to just reiterate this this what I think is being said, but I and just say it in a slightly different way that if it's a series of events um, moving from large chunks of what you know the what is a heat pump and then getting more and more refined, the end game, I think, and again, trying to make this maybe sort of enjoyable. I'm picturing an almost car talk esque event where it's very much not a PowerPoint, not yeah. the information I think you want to hear, but very question driven with a strong hand moderator. So questions don't become whatever is not a question. Opinions. And really, like, yeah. opinions, polemics, et cetera. But giving, giving, get. And so I would just plant that seed of like, who's the expert, who's not just the person that knows a ton about this stuff, but loves to talk about it, can talk well, maybe even has a Boston accent. I don't know. Just so just <laughs> think as, as we keep thinking about who that might be, think home energy car talk kind of event. I think that would be really satisfying for people um, to, to have their questions answered in that way. Yeah, you know, Jesse, I was thinking about that too. And I, I was thinking, can we make this more like a actual workshop where people like a Hitchcock center, can we use them to hold some sort of a workshop where people are learning hands-on versus an actual program through Just the education series? Carbon talk. Carbon talk. <laughs> oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or, or like the um, Nessie used to do this thing called the Green Grand Tour. And it was a Saturday, I think it was in the fall, this type of day like this type of day today. And it was, um, and, and, and people would put their house up on the tour and anyone could come all day long. That's so a great like, idea. Right, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to Stella. Stella's just committing, she's gonna spend the day home. 
and show everyone her heat pump and say, well, this worked, this mm -hmm. didn't work, and people are going to cycle through it. I've already I been doing that, that with my neighbors. <laughs> yeah, that, that that could be another way, and also a way for people to get more people involved. Um, that, that that was a very successful program pre-COVID for, for Nessie. It was all the sort of net zero and low energy houses in the valley. People would kind of tour about. Again, this is this is not necess this is this is affluent homeowners take that tour, I think. But but maybe there's a version of it that's that is a little broader and not quite as elite. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up, Jesse, because I was looking at Winchester, Massachusetts website. Um, and they had a climate festival last month and their events, I took some screenshots of that. And it was exactly that is going to somebody's house and learning. And um, yeah, it's, yeah, good point. Thank you all. Uh, Laurie, I just had one more comment. Uh, where did my notes go? Um, in terms of your leading and lagging indicators, is there, okay, so yeah, a way to track number of transitions, right? So how, yeah, I guess this is, this is an important one. How do we document that? And do we, is this like something we can work with contractors and how many projects that they're leading or something that the town can gather for us? I like I said, I think the easiest and the simplest thing for us to do is just to send out an email to everybody who's attended the webinars. Mm. You know, if it's an online thing, it's easy. If it's a if it's an in-person thing, just ask people for their email on the way in to sign up to get follow-up information and slides and stuff like that, and then send them a request. Um, and it doesn't need to be immediately afterwards, right? You'd want it to be six months or a year afterwards because you don't need any time. Yep. Um, but, you know, I, that doing anything like that is a big project all in itself. And, um, I don't know if it's, is it worth it, right? If people are showing up at these things, they're presumably interested. I take that as good in and of itself, right? <laughs> I, I, showing up. Because I used to do this work for, um, a nonprofit energy save um emails won't work yeah, okay you need a really aggressive follow-up program and um we could see if there's a community group that would be interested in making it their project but more likely if you really want to get the results you got to pay someone and right. so you know, maybe that becomes a part of our heat pump program that um, getting those metrics um, is, is uh, written in. I wonder if it's worth it if we're doing, we're doing inventories anyway, and the inventory will be periodically updated. So I think that's really the only important metric, right? <laughs> you know? Um, I, I don't know, it's a lot of work to, as you, you know, like I say, it's, it's a lot of yeah. work. Yeah, it is. My, my concern with just relying on what that one metric is it's, it's already happened and we have an update. So yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's something that we need to think about. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work, but the data is going to be important. Um, All right, any more questions for Lori? I'll stop Thanks, Lori. I should have stopped sharing a long time ago. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, Can go. I just yeah. some, say something really quickly too? Um, at the Eversource um, workshops that they had, one of the um, presenters was talking about how heat pumps are really, the United States is behind the world <laughs> for the most part, that really, you know, everywhere else, heat pump technology is 
um, sort of standard now, and the U.S. is behind in this, um, and that's why there was that whole session specifically on debunking the myth of that they're not, um, they're not efficient in New England cold weather. <laughs> they're in much colder climates. So I think it's a really, you know, it is really important to get the information out there. And also the other thing that they addressed was the fact that there's so much concern about the grid being able to handle the excess load and Eversource and National Grid were there to say they are absolutely on top of it and it will be fine, which I found somewhat reassuring <laughs> because it is such a big concern and I thought they really they they know it's coming and they're working that's what they said we know it's coming they said there have been historically um, advances in technology like this in the past and they knew they they saw them and they adapted and so this is not new for them to have to respond to new technology and more demand so I thought I would share that Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, uh, solar progress report update. So, Dwayne. Yep, uh, thanks, Vasu um, and everybody. Uh, yeah, so um, purpose here is to uh, bring uh, forward uh, the work that um, myself and with a lot of input from Steve, um, have put together to present to ECAC today as a as a um, working presentation, if you will, in terms of uh, how we see um, what ECAC um, is charged to do to some extent and 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 wants to do uh, in concert with the um, solar uh, technical assessment consultant who is coming on board with the town to. Um, assess uh, GIS map uh, out the town with regard to solar technical potential. Um, and so uh, part of that scope of work uh, involves some input from ECAC uh, to um, uh, through the town uh, to uh, direct the consultant or, or inform the consultant of, of a couple of different scenarios we want to look at uh, with regard to um, solar hosting solar capacity hosting uh, in town. Uh, and so what Steve and I put together uh, is a short uh, is a presentation of of um, what we are proposing for our methodology to come up with these scenarios. Uh, we want to go over that with you today, get some feedback um, and with the idea then that we would we would then um, quote unquote crunch the numbers through these um, methodologies to come out with recommendations at our next, um, uh, which is two weeks, the first month, the first meeting when we're back on the agenda, I guess two meetings from now, uh, we could uh, present sort of our recommendations to move forward to Stephanie and the town to then move forward to the consultant. So does that sound okay? And I can share my screen and we can go through uh, what uh, Steve and I put together um, and, and um, it just got this to Stephanie and Vasu uh, hours before the meeting, um, but it can be distributed afterwards. Um, so I will share. And um, yeah, sorry, let me just, um, as Steve was uh, uh, deeply involved in this as well, uh, Steve, I welcome you to inject any, uh, any uh, further uh, information as I'm going going through this um, and just apologize geez I'm gonna just um, uh, try to set up my screen better so I can see everybody as well as well as my screen okay great okay so uh, again we're um, looking at um, you know obviously this this issue with solar siting uh, two things. One is, I think we're all in agreement and our CARP uh, suggests that we do need to host solar in, in Amherst um, uh, to meet not only our greenhouse gas reduction um, goals, uh, but also to contribute to the Commonwealth's greenhouse gas goals. The idea here is to be as um, uh, uh, analytic as possible here, uh, to not 
through our process of, of developing these hosting scenarios is not so much to at all to suggest solar should go here or there, uh, but to come out with some reason, a reasonable range of capacities uh, we think that would be in line with our commitment, our goals and our commitments uh, and our desires. Uh, and then in the work with the consultant, um, use the mapping to come out with uh, some uh, uh, some uh, uh, different uh, frameworks or or, uh, or possibilities for how such capacities could be uh, technically um, and suitably cited in Amherst. Uh, this all would then be useful as information that then informs um, um, decision making recommendations and decision making at the town level, uh, ECAC level, as well as uh, constituents within the town. So um, I, I have like eight or nine slides, I think. So um, this one's a little bit wordy, but just basically what I uh, sort of went through. Uh, again, our idea through uh, this exercise um, that we'll lay out to you today in terms of the methodology is to uh, really develop a um, a range, say a low, medium, and high uh, range of solar capacity hosting um, that would be in line with uh, Amherst uh, goals and the Commonwealth's goals. Uh, we would then uh, submit these recommendations, discuss these recommendations as ECAC, submit these recommendations for this low, medium, high um, uh, hosting capacity uh, to the town and to the uh, solar assessment consultant uh, to then be able to incorporate in their GIS mapping uh, to get a sense of, of um, under these scenarios, how the how the, these uh, capacities could potentially be hosted within Amherst um, limitations and opportunities. Um, again, this is, in my mind, a very analytical exercise to inform Decision making. It's not decision making itself, uh, but uh, in order to make decisions about where solar uh, should go and might go or might need to go, uh, this exercise will be uh, meaningful uh, to move that conversation forward. Um, so, again, our proposed process here uh, with with the committee. Uh, is to today present and uh, discuss these several uh, possible methods um, that Steve and I came up with <clears throat> with regard to assessing and, and coming to some reasonable um, estimate for uh, uh, um, uh, sort of what the projected solar needs are uh, for hosting uh, capacity hosting in, in Amherst uh, in the 2050 timeline in the 2050 time time horizon. Uh, and uh, using a, a, a number of different approaches, three different approaches we came up with, which we'll go over. Um, and, sec and then over the next couple of weeks or, or four weeks, I guess, till the next meeting, um, we can, uh, Steve and I particularly can uh, sort of crunch those numbers uh, through these methodologies and then come up with this uh, recommendation uh, back to ECAC for discussion. Uh, of what um, of what we might move forward as a committee uh, with regard to solar capacity hosting scenarios that would then be provided to the town and to the solar assessment consultant. Um, one thing I might mention from the get-go, also for discussion, uh, but Steve and I decided to uh, remove the um, university and the two colleges from our analysis and 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 hosting scenarios uh both in terms of the the their land area and their energy loads um and their and the populations associated with those um entities um mainly because each of our three institutions have their own carbon um uh mitigation plans um and um pretty much in aligned with the state and the town uh and so if 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 we focus our idea is to focus on the town separate from the institutions do what we need to do understand what we uh what what uh, what we might need to do as a town separate from the universities 
um, in terms of solar hosting, uh, and and then leave leave the um, uh, uh, the the carbon mitigation up to the universities and the colleges um, through their own carbon mitigation plans. Um, okay, uh, so we came out with three approaches uh, to estimating uh, the solar needs or shares uh, for Amherst uh, and uh, for to, to meet both Amherst um, CARP goals, uh, as well as um, the Commonwealth's 2050 goals for decarbonization. Uh, the three methods, which I'll go in a little bit more detail on each of these uh, in the subsequent slides, was one to look at our uh, energy, uh, our, particularly our electricity um, usage in the town of Amherst, separate from the universities and colleges. This is available to us from the uh, 2017, I believe it is, uh, greenhouse gas inventory, uh, and use a method to extrapolate that to 2050. Uh, the second is to really look at the Commonwealth's 2050 roadmap. Uh, they have made um, projections in their uh, along their road map on their, along their path decarbonization pathways to what they would project solar uh, capacity needs would be for the Commonwealth to contribute to um, uh, that decarbonization, and we have uh, a method based on uh, a couple of different ways of of uh, uh, of um, calculating our share of that capacity. And then similarly, also based on the Commonwealth decarbonization roadmap, they have also provided some projections for how much solar um, would need to be, um, uh, they estimate would need to be sited on land. Uh, this is above and beyond what they project through aggressive use of the built environment. Um, but what would be left would be on land. They have some projections uh, from their 2050 uh, decarbonization roadmap. And again, we can look at that, uh, th th those projections and make some uh, estimates for Amherst based on our um, share of, of that. Uh, so let me go through these three in a little bit more uh, uh, nuance, I guess. Um, again, the first one is to extrapolate um, our own uh, Amherst data for townwide electric use uh, from uh, the present day, or I should say 2017 is, is the green, uh, most recent greenhouse gas inventory uh, and, 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 and that, that we have to work with, but pretty good data on uh, electricity consumption uh, 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 um, and can separate out the university and the and the colleges, uh, and so uh, we have that data. Um, it's from uh, my understanding is from from the utility aggregated for all ratepayers in Massachusetts. So it's pretty decent data to work with. Uh, what it does not consider is how much more electricity we may need uh, by 2050 if we. Um, uh, if um, Lori and all of us are successful in convincing everybody to electrify uh, their heating uh, as well as their transportation, uh, which is, is, is a reasonable assumption, or we want to assume that for the 2050 timeframe, um, we do have um, analysis on that, again, that the state had done to estimate that uh, that process of electrification statewide would result in a more than doubling of our electricity usage, if we, uh, our, our, our um, suggestions in our methodology just assume we're going to double uh, our electricity use from the current time to 2050 to represent that decarbon, that de uh, electrification. Um, and, um, uh, and then, and then um, uh, the, the statewide decarbonization plan uh, assume uh, obviously solar is not the only contribution uh, of renewable energy to <clears throat> generate our electricity. Uh, there's also the large scale hydro, offshore wind, and so forth. Uh, but they do uh, uh, project that um, uh, that uh, the contribution of solar would be about 25 to 30 percent of that total. So again, we can use that figure 
uh, to uh, uh, estimate mass, uh, Amherst uh, renew, uh, solar generation to meet our electric load uh, to be uh, uh, 25 to 30 percent of our electric load. Uh, and then we can calculate the solar capacity that would be needed to meet that electricity need over at least over an annual uh, time frame. So that's one methodology uh, that we've um, uh, have identified and sort of had the data together to sort of crunch the numbers. Um, there are some some assumptions here. Um, uh, but again, it's pretty robust data with regard to the electricity uh, use today. Uh, it doesn't speak anything about potential population growth in or not in in, in Amherst um, and and so forth but the idea here is not to make precise calculations or estimates because there's no need there's no um, suggestion that any any of this is going to be precise in 2050 um, but to come out with a number of different uh, data points or or ideas and then use those to um, try to sort of suggest a low medium and, and high uh, um, capacity amounts um, ac across these different uh, methodologies that we would then move forward with the uh, the technical consultants. So this, and let me, I, if, if best I can just go through the, the methodologies and, and then we can open up for discussion. Um, the second methodology, as I mentioned, was to uh, calculate our share um, of, um, uh, what Massachusetts total solar capacity goal for 2050 would be based on their 2050 roadmap. Um, now the roadmap, uh, you know, the roadmap is not just one singular road, but a number of different pathways to get to the same endpoint, um, depending on future uh, uncertainties in the future and how things sort of roll out. But uh, they do have a, so they have a range of projected solar capacity needed for uh, to meet the 2050 goal, but they have a sort of a base base case. Um, um, uh, I forget what they call that scenario, but the the um, all 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 uh, um, all policy or something um, a scenario. Uh, but we can look at the range of what's being projected across the different um, scenarios. Um, a lot more solar is needed if offshore wind or large scale hydro doesn't come through as much as uh, as as those were being projected and so forth um uh and then to uh, to calculate our share fair share uh of that capacity uh and there's two different ways that we can really look at this maybe others and happy to hear others uh, but one is uh, sort of base it more on our uh the our population relative to the the total Massachusetts population um that's one way to look at it. Um, uh, uh, that that brings up issues with regard to is that assuming, you know, we we have much denser, uh, less dense population in Amherst than um, than Boston does. Uh, um, so another way to look at this is more, uh, and but we have more more uh, probably more dense population than many of our neighboring towns. Uh, but um, uh, the other way to look at it is more, you know, in terms of our share is by land area, given that solar is kind of more land, the resource primarily is land um, uh, or, or rooftops and so forth. But um, uh, um, so uh, that's that's two ways to look at it. We can slice it and dice it both ways and see what type of numbers we come out with and see what sort of rain, ranges we uh, those methodologies provide. Um, and then the uh, the third is is uh, is um, uh, is a little bit similar in terms of using the state state data uh, and then looking at our fair share based on either population or or um, or land area, but a little different in that um, uh, the the state uh, in their decarbonization roadmap you know did specifically provide some information with regard to their projections um, on on um, the estimated number of acreage, not so much capacity, but acreage of ground mounted solar that would be needed in addition to their projections of maximizing rooftop development. I would caveat that by saying that I think the state is um, 
I wouldn't say necessarily reconsidering, but uh, recalculating to some extent and going through, as folks know, they're going through a process of their own statewide technical potential study, uh, which I think will better uh, enable them to make uh, to, to make these projections. But nonetheless, in the time frame that we're working under right now, this is some data uh, that we have to work with from the uh, from the state uh, analysts and, uh, and 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 roadmap. Uh, and so they have uh, again a bit of a range depending on which uh, which pathway of the acreage across this across the Commonwealth that would most likely be needed for land ground mounted solar. That doesn't mean all in the forest or on farm fields. It also includes uh, other lands like brown fields and land fields and so forth, but it's um, it's beyond the built environment, put it that way. Um, and so we can also look at that and make some uh, some uh, uh, some a method methodology to then you know estimate or calculate what our share of that land would be uh, based on our uh, either 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 our proportion by population or by land area. Notably, that um, is only a portion of the solar capacity that the state is um, estimating we need uh, for the roadmap, uh, but does give us sort of this data point with regard to um, uh, uh, land-based uh, solar in particular. So those were the three methods with, with data that we have to work with that Steve and I came up with. Um, and we can, you know, we, we weren't really, we, we were sort of working with the numbers uh, and uh, not really settled, quite settled yet to exactly how to present to make these final calculations and, and settle on, on sort of these numbers yet. So we wanna have some additional uh, time in the next few weeks to crunch those out and prepare them. Uh, but essentially our idea then is to sort of bring these alternative approaches together. Um, these approaches will um, separately uh, generate estimates to inform, inform, not 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 recommend, but inform um, uh, Amherst goals with regard to solar capacity hosting. Um, and my guess is these different approaches will cover a range of uh, of of um, uh, estimated capacity needed. Um, and uh, we will then seek to. Um, Est, look at these uh, estimate, est, this range of estimates somewhat holistically uh, to uh, support then a recommendation for a low, medium, and high solar capacity, solar capacity hosting scenarios for Amherst um, uh, uh, based on on the, the range that we come out with with these with these estimates, um, and then the idea would be that the solar assessment consultant. Uh, with with their GIS mapping that they would would will be doing over the course of the next number of months, uh, we will with through the town offer these scenarios low, medium, and high if it comes out that way of capacity. We think we um, would like to figure out how we what what the opportunities are uh, to host those capacities in Amherst. Um, and it would be really up to the working with the solar consultant to then inform, uh, use that analytical tool, GIS tool, to then inform us and the town and constituents on the range of possibilities, given the limitations and opportunities we have in Amherst, um, uh, of how that range of solar capacity could potentially be sited in, 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 in town. Um, now, you know, for any given solar capacity, um, there's many different ways that could be hosted. It could be all on one type of siting. It could be all on another, but there may be constraints. We only have so much of this. We only have so much of that. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, within those constraints and those opportunities of, of uh, how much built environment we have, how much parking lots we have, uh, how much suitable land we have, uh, what would be reasonable uh, rain, uh, 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 ways in which these um, uh, illustrative ways in which uh, the, these capacities could be uh, distributed in different uh, uh, around Amherst, around the town and in, in different solar siting, um, different solar sites. Um, 
so that's that and that's the that's what steve and i uh, sort of came up with um to um offer to ecac for your input uh and thoughts and rec and and uh, suggestions um as we go forward to you know try to put these uh capacity scenarios together uh that the ecac itself can can uh can um move forward as recommendations to the um to the town so i'll stop there and uh, yeah, maybe thanks, uh, Lane happy, and Steve. happy to hear anything first from steve if he wants to add add to that no nothing to add i think let's um see if there's any questions from ECAC about the, the methods. Yeah. This is a lot of good work, Steve and Dwayne. Thank you. I can I can bring that back up if yes, we see. need to, but easier to see yeah, people. Just to clarify, just to make sure I understand it. Um, the, you're proposing to take three methodologies and then for each of those three, do a high, medium, and low scenario, and then conform all that? Or, or are you trying to pick a, met, the, a preferred methodology or something else? I, th I think for each methodology, we would put in a range of data that we see in the, the roadmap and the affiliated reports. Um, and so for each methodology, we would get a range, but that range would be just based on the different estimates, say, of total solar capacity that the reports say. Um, it, some of the reports sometimes say one value, and then a newer report says a slightly different value. Um, so we would try to pull out that range of values, say, for total solar capacity, run that through and get a high and a low um, for a particular method. And then I imagine a chart that shows three bars that show, show the range of acreage needed, the solar capacities in terms of megawatts, but also convert that to acreage needed for each of these three methods. And, and that'll get us a better idea of what, what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we'll come back to you all and we'll then discuss what that high, low and medium recommendation to provide to the consultants would be. Yeah, and and I, I would agree with that. I, I would not. My 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 thought is not to necessarily tie our low, medium, high to any one methodology, right? Um, because you know different people might want to select different method. Think different methodologies are are better, better ways of going about it. Uh, but if we can, and Steve was visioning a bar graph. I was visioning a scatter plot of you know maybe <laughs> you know eight or ten different estimates that come out come out from these three different scenarios. Um, and then, you know, if they're, if they sort of cover a range, then we sort of go, you know, one side, middle and, and the other side as sort of a low, medium and high. So you'll reconcile all of, all of your methodologies and come, kind of come out with three, three numbers. Yeah, they, 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 again, that are not necessarily tied yep. to any one method, uh, but cover, yep. the, cover the range. Um, yeah. Uh, and all with the caveat we got to see where we, see what it looks like when we get to the other side uh and then um and then figure out how best to go about it okay yeah so for I proposals be oh sorry jesse go ahead i was just gonna say when you get to the end if you want uh to sort of turn it into a graphic mm. that is more user friendly um Feel free to shoot me any data. I think we've got some capacity in the office here to sort of like plot it on a map or turn it into households or something. We could kind of do some translations if, if you think that's where this is headed, or if it's just a, some hard science that's going to the committee, then we don't need to make it user friendly. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, um, um, this exercise is not to suggest it should be on it, it should be this capacity should be cited on uh, on on in 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 any in any particular way that's going to be the second phase once we get the um the the technical potential resource mapping from the consultant uh to help us then then look at at how how these different um 
hosting capacities could or, or ranges of how they could be um, cited uh, um, in, in within the town. Yeah, so I, I was thinking when, when we were talking about fair share, and I know we've talked about this quite a bit, for proposals B and C, you're going to have two scenarios, essentially, low, medium, high for proposal B for using current population data and a low, medium, high use for current land data. And you're going to do the same for proposal C as well. So basically, you're going to end up with 15 total numbers, right? Um, it could be. I'm not sure where you're coming out with low, medium, high with each of the different methodologies. Yeah, so I was thinking you would have a low, maybe I'm, okay, I guess when you come out of each proposal, you're going to have a specific number and you're going to say, you're going to create a range for low, medium, high or? Well, again, these aren't, I, I wouldn't, th these different methodologies are not proposals. They're just different methodologies, right. analytical methodologies to um, help ECAC and the town to grapple with the question of how much solar is reasonable for Amherst to strive to host. Um, uh, again, based on either our different methodologies, our energy use, our fair share of what the state capacity needs are, right. or our fair share of the state uh, of the state expectation of, of what ground mounted solar uh, might need to be across the state. Uh, each of those, each of those um, methodologies have assumptions as Steve mentioned, uh, methodologies within the reports that we're drawing from, as well as, you know, some uh, uncertainties about, you know, even uncertainties about what our, what our um, population is compared to the, ta the, 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 the Commonwealth. There's, you know, different we can consider different ways to consider our population given our student body and so forth. So there may be, um, you know, within each of those methodologies uh, as well as um, data coming from the roadmap, which is a range of data, um, they will, will in, in each methodology, will consider uh, a range of data, each one coming out with a, a capacity uh, and uh, I'm not sure if they're going to be three in each one, but there'll be several in each one to sort of cover the range of of um, uh, uncertainty or, or projections that the state has has uh, has offered. Uh, and uh, and and all those results will then be sort of co-mingled together uh, as these different methodologies. In, in my mind, we can sort of separate them in different symbols so you can see which one came from which which uh, uh, methodology. Uh, but then to uh, sort of use those to um, try to come to some reasonable consensus or, or, th or thought in terms of here's a low, medium, and high range uh, that we we um, want to, at least as an analytical exercise, see how that would fit into Amherst, the town of Amherst, in terms of solar siting. Yeah, you, yes, uh, Steve has a, I, I knew you were drawing some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is what I'm thinking. Go ahead. Yeah. And just conceptually, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, methods A, B, and C, each one of those will provide a range and hope, hopefully there'll be some overlap. <laughs> and then we can pick, if you can see across the bottom, yeah. you know, we might not pick the lowest of the low, but we might pick something close to the low end of the, of the low. And then, so our three, values would be low, medium, high based on the overlap and the extension of the three different methodologies. I like that. And yeah. then e each of these yeah. bars would be you know, different assumptions about or using yeah. different inputs from the, um, the roadmap or perhaps different assumptions about future population. And so our chart might explain why there's a range for method A and why there's a range for method B. But then the net result would be down, yeah, down at the bottom, yeah. low, medium, and high. I'm sorry. It's done. It's just, you guys agree? Um, yeah. Well done. We'll send that to the consultant. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll and then you'll install it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, go ahead. That'll be a lagging indicator. 
<laughs> um, okay. okay. So you want our feedback today on the different methodologies. Or any other methodologies. Or any other things that might also be asked of the consultant. And then you're going to crunch numbers based on reports to show us what, you know, maybe we'll say one of those scenario methodologies should be scrapped. So you won't do crunch those numbers. Is that, that's the kind of feedback you want. Otherwise right. you would have just come to us with the numbers for all of that, all of those, maybe not 15 <laughs> possibilities, but. Yeah, if, if, if you guys say that you don't like the assumption in methodology A, where we're starting with current or 2017 electric data, you don't like extrapolating that out to 2050, it's like, no, nah, no, nah, that doesn't seem reliable, then we don't have to use method A, we could use methods B and C. Or likewise, maybe you, consensus comes out here that we don't like the approach of ratioing Amherst population to Massachusetts population. Methods B and C both rely on that. If you are collectively, we're uncomfortable with that approach, then we're stuck with method A. Perhaps maybe we come up with a, a different method. Um, we'll put our thinking caps back on and see if we can come up with a different method. So yeah, so take a look at those assumptions associated and see if you're comfortable or not with them and let us let us know. Um, I'm also you, hoping that maybe some of the public attendees might have some other ideas or some suggestions that they can relate to us um, at the public comment at the end of the meeting. Yes. So just to clarify, the discussion that you want right now is about some of those general questions like, how do we like using population? How do we like using land mass? And perhaps you could remind us of the other major question. I think that would be a good way for us to go about this discussion. Yep, yes, or, yes, yes. Or, or, or any other ways of slicing and dicing this up. Um, uh, again, I think the, um, you know, the, this substantial assumption also with the, you, the method A, which was based on our electricity load, um, was one doubling this for 2050 for electrification, but also, you know, going with the state assumption that 25, I think, to 30 percent of our electricity statewide will come from solar. Um, that's that's that may be a reasonable estimate, but does that mean that number should apply to Amherst as well? Um, if there's any thoughts or suggestions otherwise, um, you know, that that would be great. I think the 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 um, what we do need is some analytical methodology to get to um, uh, some scenarios we want to um, use this technical, this consultant uh, to help us envision uh, how that capacity could be hosted in Amherst uh, to help inform the conversation and decision-making from there. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like this is this is both a scientific and a philosophical question. And right, one is an analytic methodology, and one is which one feels right, which one do we like? I mean, that's so my sense is I would not get rid of anything. In fact, if anything, add another. This sounds like a classic example of like you'd have mutually canceling errors. We're trying to get a sense of what this number should be and be able to back that sense up with some data, but it's very much these, this is like back of a very big envelope, if I'm not mistaken here. We're just, you're trying to like back up, you know, we, people have made all kinds of sweeping generalizations about numbers. You're going a step further for the town and say, to back up some numbers, but they're still kind of made up numbers based on myriad assumptions that will change and therefore like, the more the merrier, I think, as far as the sort of perceived accuracy. We looked at all these different ways. 
if you go this direction, it's low. If you go this direction, it's high. Therefore, we think somewhere in the middle makes sense. I mean, I, I can't, I wouldn't take anything out no, as far no. as methodologies. They, they only, they work, it seems like they work together. Yeah, Again. I mean, to some extent, I think more methodology is the better uh, to see. To um, a point, yeah. To, like to the, three to, to point. five seems like you've done your due diligence. We're not make. We're not just big solar coming in and running roughshod here. We've like actually done some math based on some values and some philosophies, and and they all come out in this range. Now, if there's a huge outlier, yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, but yeah. until that happens. I'm excited to see your number. And, and we'll obviously also take into account how much Amherst already has um, cited, uh, which is not, um, is, you know, is a, is a, is a um, start <laughs> along, along these ways. It, um, um, it's actually pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah. Lori, if I can call on. Right. Um, I wanted to also agree that this looks like a, a reasonable cross-section of methodologies to use. And I also wanted to be a little careful. I, I uh, Jesse, you know, I, I'm comfortable with error bars, with the idea of uncertainties. Um, hopefully these things aren't wildly off, that, that the point of putting a range is that, you know, the range is stating that this is where we reasonably think we're gonna end up if we use this method uh, to calculate what we should contribute. Um, so I think, you know, educating the public, I think in the process, we'll be educating the public a little bit about measurements and uncertainties, but, um, you know, hopefully the, the uncertainties are sufficiently large that, uh, you know, we will fall somewhere in that range is where this method would bring us. Yeah. Not quite as a shot. Jesse, you said something that made it sound like it was a, a bit of a crapshoot, and it's a little better than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think to Jesse, oh, that's 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 you sound like Darth Vader. it's six o'clock. Okay. That's so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Does anyone have any additional comments? Go ahead. Oh, Stella. I just think it would be cool because it sounds like a lot of this is going to happen in like. I don't know, Excel or R or Python or however this like Excel. Okay. Excel. So if Simple it's an Excel, Excel spreadsheet, I like, I would encourage that to be formatted in such a way that it's clear what assumptions led to what numbers yeah. and then yeah. that just be available. So sure. if I like want to download the Excel spreadsheet and I'm just like a citizen who's not or a person who's not on ECAC and like, play with some numbers, I can just do that. And it's so like, yeah. if you kind of know how to use Excel, you can kind of see how some of this plays out if you want to make your own assumptions or change assumptions or or so on. So I would just suggest that it be like heavily commented and well formatted and then made available. Given the large numbers of geeks in this town, that might be appropriate. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or even not in this town, like for other, Towns would be like an incredibly cool little like calculator. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Thanks. So. so I think the consensus then is to use all the assumptions and come up with this data that we can look at. You sound terrible, Vasu. Yeah, the, <laughs> the marbles have come back. But... <laughs> I think let's see. Um, so, yeah, I, I was going to say that. So the consensus then is to look at all the data, all the assumptions, put them together. Let's look at the data and then yeah. figure out what, how to approach it. And does that make sense for everybody? How, how soon can we get this spreadsheet out to everybody? Uh, not the spreadsheet, this PowerPoint that Dwayne has um, put together. Because you might come up with some ideas after you've looked at it a little more closely. And I think if you, if you do that in the next few days, this next yeah. week or so, then Dwayne and I can um, take any comments that might come to you in that time. So I, I guess can forward it out, Steve, as soon as the meeting's over. Great. And I'll also post it right into the packet. I can do that right away. In fact, the presentations that we have that be, that came in last minute will be loaded into the packets. I think I was able to put Lori's, but I didn't have Dwayne's or mine, which is pretty small, but yeah, it'll great. all go out. 
Perfect. Then, yeah, then read, then read it, send your comments, I guess, to Stephanie and Vasu, and they'll forward them to Dwayne and me. Andra, closing comments, maybe in a minute. I have a um, possible, just going to throw it out there. Um, I brought it up before, but um, as a possible methodology for slicing and dicing is um, wealth. Amherst wealth relative to the rest of the state. That would be very interesting. Yeah. And if, you know, I don't know how this could be done, but some members of our community are wealthy and some are very much not. So, we, you know, in this area, we have a um, higher percentage of children on reduced or free lunch. It's like 45%. Um, so I don't know how you, how you work something like that in, but just wanted to throw it out as. Are, are you th thinking something like median income? For the town of Amherst, compared no, see, that's to that's the thing. Median, median income, income doesn't get at it. I know because yeah. kind of it gets at gets at one factor, right? But I, I mean, our gross regional product would be another approach. But I don't know if that if that's data that's available, right? For the town and um, what about the environmental justice stats? I thought that there are some statistics in that chart that yeah. you could utilize. We can look at that. I, I just, yeah. I'm just trying. What, what is the, what would be the method? Of, what would you, what would we do with that? Some relative sort of, data, some sort of weighting factor. Yeah, it's just like your population and land, and you have wealth is your third factor. So, if we're wealthier, we should host more, re uh, proportionally, or, or. Um, yeah, but what, yeah, the question is, what if you cannot? What if you don't have? the land like you're well, lost. So I, I was thinking about how um, I'm assuming that people are working on making solar more and more efficient, but the cutting edge is more expensive at any given time. So maybe if we're wealthier and want to save on how much land we use, we would go with the more expensive, more efficient, you know, so, so it would come out somehow in the options um, as a value. Yeah, I think it's complex. It's a good one, but it's very complex. Um, yeah. We'll give it some more thought. I've, yeah. I've, I've grappled with that a little bit and I haven't quite figured out a way to, to do it, <laughs> but we can give it some more thought. If you guys come up with more concrete ideas or know of a data source about wealth across the state that we might be able to use, that would be a great help. I, Lorraine and Stella. I wonder if there's a correlation between how much energy we use and wealth. There is. Wealthy people use more energy, have a bigger carbon footprint. In which case it might come out in in that way, looking at actual usage as a yeah, per, yeah. but percent of the state. Yeah, I'm a little bit. Um, I don't know exactly how. I mean, Amherst, we we have relatively little industry or even commerce uh, compared to, I think, the state average uh I, I don't know if that's true but certainly compared to more you know 495 and in um um i mean we could look at residential usage you know per per resident but i'm not but we can we can look i'm not sure if that data is available but we can look at that stella final thoughts we have to wrap this up 
Oh, no, I was just reading. I was wondering if maybe if um, the fair share amendment passes, if that would be a data set that would be hmm. available. But similar to like in that's just income. That's not that's not wealth, um, which I don't think is is necessarily the best way of, of pulling that data. All right, I would say if there's more suggestions, send it over to Steve or Dwayne um, yeah. in the next couple of weeks or next week. Yeah, yeah. The next okay. All right. Yeah, great, great conversation. Thanks, everybody. All right, let's go to the next topic. We have a few more. Um, so the next one is around the strategy execution, and I, I covered that. So um, I don't think we have anything else to discuss there. And then we'll jump to the open meeting law. So okay. Stephanie, if you want to. I have just a few slides and I'll, I'm going to make this really super quick because I'd rather get to my report more so than even this particular um, issue. But what's come up repeatedly um, over the years has been um, the ability of members to work together. And there's been a lot of um, different viewpoints on and interpretations of what means and and who can work together. Um, so I got clarification from Athena O'Keefe, who is clerk to the council and very much the town expert on open meeting law. Um, I, I trust her feedback implicitly. So I'm gonna start with a few things. So just give me one moment and I'll share my screen. I'm sorry, okay. sorry to interrupt. Number five on the agenda is review strategy execution. Plus yeah, just I'm, I'm, that. that's, that's, yeah, that's the thing we covered at the start of the meeting where we oh, had the oh, additional. Okay. So very quickly, um, I just provided you with some hyperlinks to the open meeting law and to sort of help get you to some sections that I thought would make it um, things that are probably more relevant for you. This is the, the main link um, to open meeting law. There's a lot of information. So from this main site, I pulled out some of these other hyperlinks. Um, the guide is really what you wanna look at. It's just your very quick summary. It's been sent to you before. You've probably had it, you probably looked through it. The problem is it's, it is very generic. It doesn't cover any, you know, every scenario, which is virtually impossible, but um, it does give you a kind of a good summary and general guidance. Um, the frequently asked questions, I am gonna open this hyperlink real quick. Uh, so there's a whole list of frequently asked questions and the ones that I wanted to direct you to that probably seem the most relevant are the questions about public bodies and then the questions about open meeting law deliberation and electronic communication. I thought those were questions yeah, that Stephanie, are- Stephanie, you're not sharing. You oh, I'm have... sorry. Okay, well, if you go, if you go to this, um, Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I'm going to stop sharing and open up again. Sorry about that. You'll make sure we get that slide, right? Yes, I'm going to send I'm going to send all of the slides out after this meeting and I will post them in the meeting packet online. So are you seeing this now? No, slide the present. Yes, we're seeing that. We weren't seeing, I think you clicked on the link and we weren't yeah, seeing it. Yeah, I'm not gonna even bother with the link then. I just don't wanna okay. take up the time. Just it, all I wanna mention is that when you open up this particular link, it's gonna give you a list of questions, frequently asked questions. And what I wanted to direct you to are the ones about the public meeting in general for public bodies. Um, and then also the one about electronic communications. Um, and then I wanted to point out this last link will open up the access to the trainings that are coming up and there's one in um, one in October, one in November and one in December. So there are trainings to attend. I'm even thinking that I would like to actually sign up for one of these again myself. It's been a while, um, but they can be really useful. And the town, um, we've discussed having another open meeting law training session um, that would be facilitated probably by Kobelman and Page, which is our town legal counsel um, for committees. So for not just ECAC, but for 
other committees in town. Uh, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. I'm gonna stop sharing and just switch again, sorry. Okay. So Stephanie, one, one thing that I was trying to read the open meeting law to, if you if there is a seminar that you're aware of, you can forward that to everybody. And a that's seminar? okay. Yeah, like oh, a, yeah, that's fine. Giving a talk, that, that can be yeah, shared. That's with fine. Me. I wanted to just what I wanted to point out, and I'm gonna now share some correspondence from an email with Athena that I wanted to direct people to. Um, so just bear with me one second, I'll share this screen. Um, so the, the thing that we get into and, and I'm, I'm it, trying to discuss open meeting law is going down an incredible rabbit hole. I have gone down this rabbit hole with Athena on things where we have gone back and forth and the more we communicated, the more confusing it got. So I just want to cover the scenario that we most run into that really has the simplest guidance. So I'm going to focus on this one, which is just that, um, you know, when we have more than one member meet with another member. So if Vasu directs more than one person to work on something. So say he said, Duane and Steve, go work on this together. That is a subcommittee. If he directs Duane to go work on it by himself and Duane reaches out to Steve to work on this with him, this issue, whatever it is with him. And then Duane comes back and presents it to the committee as he's done. That is not a violation of open meeting law. Now, it's not to say that you cannot work in groups of two or multiple members. You absolutely can do that. Vasu can direct you to do that. However, then you are a subcommittee and you are subject to the guidance and rules of open meeting law, which means it has to be posted. You have to take minutes, um, you know, and it has to be at this point now we're recording our meeting. So we'd probably want to have it recorded as well. So this guidance is from our legal counsel. So as much as I greatly value and appreciate all of your viewpoints, your interpretation of me open meeting law does not stand because you're a committee that is a town committee, it's KP law's guidance that we have to follow. So the reason why is because we can be subject to um, a civil penalty of up to $1,000 for each intentional violation. Now, how do you define that as an intentional violation is that I have communicated with you all and let you know that this is the case, this is the town's interpretation. And if you choose to ignore that and then work outside of a meeting and Vasu directs you to work with a few people um, or you on your own reach out to five people and so you've exceeded a quorum and you're, there's six of you that you've reached out to, um, you're collaborating on the same thing. There's a quorum that's also going to open you up to a violation of open meeting law. So it just, you have to be careful. You don't want to exceed a quorum in your outreach. You want to keep it. I would always say just go shy of a quorum um, by at least one member. And you don't want to each talk to each other. You probably want to just communicate through that main member who's been um, identified as being a sort of leader on a task. And you also want to ensure that the members that you reach out to don't then themselves reach out to other members, right? So Lori reaches out to three people, but you don't want those three people to reach out to the additional members because then again, you're in violation of open meeting law. So I'm trying to keep this as sort of basic and as simple as I can, because like I said, it can easily bring you down um, a rabbit hole. So I just wanted to clarify this just so that we all know um, and we're clear about it and that we don't run in, run in a foul of open meeting law. So again, you just can't be Vasu can't name more than one person as leading a task. And if that person then after the meeting wants to reach out, that's fine. So, and the other thing is if you all wanted to go off on your own and create some whole other group <laughs> outside um, that's an advocacy group, <laughs> you could you could do that. But um, 
but the work that you do for ECAC specifically has to be open, you know, um, for transparency to the public. So that's all. Thanks, Stephanie. So if there's information that we're sharing about a law that passed, about some training, that can be emailed to everybody. We don't have to email it to you and have you forward it to everybody, correct? Um, you can, yeah. I mean, you can, what you want to be clear and that the best thing to do when you're sending out information like that is to make sure you write, do not reply. Like no one should reply, do not reply all. Because the minute you reply all, if someone has a comment to what you've sent and sends it to the whole group, you're potentially in violation. So yeah, you just want to yeah. make sure that you're not, you know, just you can send things out, but no one should be replying to it. And there should not be any back and forth about what you're sending at all. And you should always copy me when you send something out to the group. Any, you know, whoever does. Thanks, Stephanie. I know it's... Uh complex and it slows things down but it's the law so uh, yeah. <laughs> well but there's a reason it's it's yeah. you know it's to make sure that decisions are being made in the public view so that people can weigh in and you know we've got people that you know attend and want to weigh in and other people you don't you know other people watch the recordings so it's not like they're always um necessarily here but they're watching and they wouldn't get the information if they don't have the option Andre? Um, there's a lot that I could say, but I really want to get to our updates. So then given time, um, I won't, but as the new head of work area, state and regional issues, anyone who is interested in, um, what's happening in changing and updating the open meeting law to, um, you know, the 20th century, really, um, <laughs> in terms of electronic access and true access to be able to participate in government. Um, it's something I think about a lot. And um, yeah, I could use you know, help thinking about what might be done in terms of advocacy. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, um, Stephanie, I know you have a lot of updates, so. Uh, I can do them quickly and I've narrowed my list because I gave you some of it earlier. So the big thing that I wanted to share is that we have a contract with GZA Geo Environmental for doing the solar assessment. So, um, they uh, would like to be on the schedule for your next meeting on the 26th. They are starting with a solar survey list of a list of questions for a solar survey to go out to um, department heads and then probably the general public as well. But they wanted to review those questions both with you and the solar bylaw working group. The solar bylaw working group will have them a week before you. Um, they also want to be able to just give kind of a, a brief overview and presentation to you as well, but it would not be for the whole meeting. It, you know, again, because we only have limited funding and limited amount of their time that they can commit to meetings, we just want to sort of chip away at this a little bit and give them an opportunity to, to first introduce themselves and then to talk a bit about what they're doing and about the survey questions. So they're starting with that. They're going to take the questions, get your input, get solar bylaw working groups input to the questions, um, maybe tweak them based on your feedback, and then they would um, submit them to department heads. We would have a department head meeting that I would work with them with uh, on, and we would present the information to select department heads. It probably won't be all of the department heads. They're not all necessarily relevant uh, to this topic, but um, we would certainly have probably a good fair number of the department heads to present to. Um, so that's the first thing um, I yeah, submitted. I mean, Stephanie, yeah, we can yep. add them to the next week's agenda, next yep. meeting's agenda. Yep. So, um, and again, it might be only at the very most, I would say 20 minutes. I don't think they're okay. going to want to take too much more time than that. Um, I also wanted to let you know that I submitted applications uh, proposals for two fellows for the summer of 23, one for the greenhouse gas inventory update and one for a municipal building 
inventory uh, with creation of a timeline to change out fossil fuels. Um, also, um, still working on that, um, entering a contract with Utilimark for the fleet greenhouse gas inventory um, and timeline for conversion to EVs. Um, and let's see, I think, oh, and the other thing, unfortunately, um, so when we were, I think I told you like over a month or so ago, we had met with consultants, uh, engineering consultants to identify some projects for our Green Communities grant application. And sadly, they did not get me the report in time so that I could not um, apply for this round of Green Communities funding. However, um, all was not totally lost because we can apply for the spring round. Um, we do have the, you know, we do have the information they provided. So we have information. It just means we have to wait till the spring round. But also, um, one of the things that uh, we discussed when we had a meeting with the consultant was which buildings we were going to focus on for, um, you know, heat pump installations. And I brought up town hall. I asked where we were with our, um, with the town hall. And it sounds like we actually, the building is well insulated and it's actually poised for some heat pump technology. Um, however, the consultants said that they weren't able to really come up with anything. I don't really buy that. I think they just felt pressured for time. Um, and I wanna reach out to CEE, the Clean Energy Extension and also Ben Weil and see if we can get somebody in before the spring to actually get that data that we could use because we could, we're, we could easily make Town Hall our first fossil fuel free building and that would so many reasons that that would really be a great achievement. So um, that's really kind of my goal for Green Communities funding, um, number one. We do have other projects, they're smaller. I think some of those we can cover with other funding sources. So um, that's kind of my punch list that I have off the top of my head today. Thanks, Stephanie. Andra, and then Jesse. No, I just didn't lower my hand, sorry. Oh, Jesse and Steve. Ste Stephanie, that's super exciting. Um, just for me to wrap my head around it, do you can, what is the current space conditioning, heating and cooling system serving Town Hall right now? So we have um, uh, forced uh, hot air and we have um, a chiller unit out back. So we could actually just like replace the chiller unit with other technology. Um, so it's a gas-fired furnace and a, and a chiller? Uh, I think oil, actually. An oil so, furnace and a chiller? Yeah, yes. Cool. So I think we could Very, change those out. Very exciting. I mean, we're already drawing in the, you know, the air exchange. I feel it all the time. It's right over my desk. I feel like there's ways we could definitely <laughs> tie into the existing um, infrastructure and make this work. And Jeremiah, I met with a facilities manager and he was the one who, when I asked him about it, he was sort of thought about it for a minute and he said, yeah, we could probably do that. And I said, okay, can we move this to the front of the line? <laughs> so, cause we're looking at Munson Library too. And I think, you know, absolutely we should be doing Munson Library. There's no question, but I just think it would be really nice to sort of make this the first building. So- Yeah, um, super. Meaningful. Yeah, so it's Great. just a again, it's just a matter of finding the right technology, and it's I know it's out there. I know it's out there. So I'm we just have to get the right information, and we have to have people who know where to find it. So again, I look to Dwayne and his team of folks. Steve, you had a question. Uh, not a question. I have um, updates. I guess I jumped the gun there a little bit. I'm... I have a question. Andre, go ahead. What can we do um, to get our um, to get KP Law to make it a priority to move the joint powers agreement for the CCA? KP Law is not the problem. They already responded. Rick responded. It's it's um, we're waiting on Northampton's legal counsel to respond. We've had KP Law's response a while ago, mm. and Chris is now leading that effort. So I am stepping oh, back I, from cracking my whip about it. I've I've done 
Um, and I know Chris reached out. I saw his outreach communication. So um, we just need to go back to KP Law to um, it's like ready to go. Um, well, I think it was a matter of KP Law suggestions and Northampton's legal counsel reviewing their the last edits that they had suggested and and i i don't know what i don't know what the disconnect is and i don't i don't want to spend time at this meeting getting into all of that i just want to say that it's not kp law that's holding this up and i i suggested to chris mason that he reach out to the mayor and see if the mayor can move this along that's that was my suggestion at this point Thanks, Stephanie. Um, let's move on to ECAC member updates. We don't have a lot of time. So Steve. <laughs> okay, um, I'll do this quick. Mandy Joe from the CRC wrote to me just a couple of days ago, and they are moving forward on the residential rental property bylaw developments. Uh, it's, it's quite a major revamping to it. If you're interested in that, there, the documents are available from the town on that. But right now they have sort of a placeholder for energy efficiency standards as part of the uh, rental permit uh, process. And they have some meetings coming up. One is tomorrow, CRC will be discussing this. They'll be presenting a little bit of information to town council on the 17th of October, and then a public forum on the 24th. So they're moving forward. It'll probably not really become a formal draft until November, but, what I would like to do is to recommend in, um, to Mandy and CRC that rather than add, uh, adopting actual energy efficiency standards now, that we take more of a data gathering approach, which is what we, we've talked about this in the past. Um, the current draft has town inspectors doing what looks to be a pretty comprehensive inspection at least every three years, some cases five, some cases one year of rental properties um, that looks for um, quite a quite an extensive list. I was surprised, uh, including checking that outlets are correctly wired and that windows have latches and locks on them and such. So what I'd like to propose is that inspectors do a quick building assessment um, that will help us. One would be to confirm the age of the building, the type of fuels that are used for heating and cooling, the age and efficiency of the, of the uh, HVAC and domestic hot water appliances, um, perhaps a, a quick estimate if there's insulation and, and a qualitative assessment of air leakage. If the inspectors can do that, I think that would go a long ways towards helping us identify the buildings that will need help. Um, and then, suggest also as a recommendation to CRC that they have rental properties be required to get a mass save audit, an, an appropriate audit for the property size. And that might be something like within five years or every five years. And then as a third recommendation would be that the apartment complexes with five or more units, maybe it's seven or more units, um, larger units are required to report, to begin to report aggregated energy use and um, energy use intensity uh, as part of the rental process so we can begin to collect that data. There's already many towns and cities in, in Massachusetts requiring the bigger buildings to, to report that kind of information. So those are the recommendations I'd love to make um, to CRC in the coming week or two. Uh, for the energy efficiency component of the new rental registration bylaw. Thanks, Steve. Any comments on that? I, I didn't get the second recommendation, sorry. <clears throat> the second recommendation would be all rental properties re are re be required to get a mass save audit within five years. Why, why five years? I don't know. That seemed like a reasonable time to give people to do it. It could be sooner. We could say three. I don't think you could have them more often than that, can you? That's a good question. Yeah, you can't maybe have not. them more often than every two years. Two years. So. 
Yeah, this was, I guess, the way I was thinking it, that, that they would need, they could have a couple of years, they would need to get it and report it as part of the rental permit process within five years. And I, I didn't think about whether we would, the town would require an audit every five years. That's not what I was thinking. Just at least one audit that's not more than five years old, something like that. Shorten it. Okay, I'll say three. Within three years, that sound good? Three. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Other member updates? The budget cycle is coming up, so we, I, we have to figure out how we're going to propose as part of the agenda or part of our charges to plan and prioritize. So how are we going to help the town prioritize actions? And yeah, I, something that we need to discuss. And, and <clears throat> so that means we, we need to start preparing our annual report process too. That so too. Not just budget. Correct. Yeah. So I know Stephanie, you sent me uh, some information on the budgeting process. So I'll take a look at it and see what we could do. Items on the cart that we can push forward. I have an another update. I didn't see in my emails. Did the um, announcement go out to this group about the multi-family um, retrofitting without displacement um, to, to the group? Yes, I forwarded it. Thank you. Thank you. So specifically for municipal officials, um, it's a bit geared towards their questions. So we, we are municipal officials, it turns out. Okay, so for the next agenda, we have the consultant coming and then we have the two progress reports. So for the progress reports, we don't have to go over everything again. It's what's changed since the last meeting. That's That should be enough. And hopefully that can, we can be under two hours. I was hoping be under one hour, but we'll see how it goes. Um, can, I, yeah. can I request that the draft minutes go out sooner so that people can see the items or? Perhaps, Fasu, your summary of action items could go out sooner, soon after, um, as a reminder for people. Yeah, that's, yeah, right now it's all Stephanie, so I can send yeah, it to One her. thing I can tell you is that with draft minutes, it also depends on who's taking the minutes, how thorough and complete they are. I've had to spend time watching, re-watching entire meetings depending on who's taking minutes. So, um, and it's not just this committee. I spent four hours watching another committee's minutes last week to fill in the gaps. So everyone does them a little differently. Stephanie, if I, say that I would be, I, I would be very open to feedback. I want to make your job. So if I'm one of those people, you feel free to email me separately. Um, I, I think, if, and if anyone else is open to feedback, uh, you're not going to step on any toes. Let's 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 keep this easy for you. So any anything that can help that. But That's but also, great. it's our responsibility, and so we should read it and say this was an important piece that was missed that needs to go in, and not your responsibility. That's, but That's also. May, I mean, I feel like maybe a reasonable compromise is Stephanie just emailing out like three sets of minutes that are really good mm -hmm. to model off of. Because like minutes taking, I mean, like, it's not like a taught skill. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's helpful to have like a template. Uh, so I think if Stephanie just emails out like three really good minutes that didn't require rewatching meetings, that should be enough. That's a think. good idea. Is it okay if I call somebody out right off the top to say who typically consistently has the best minutes that I have very little to do? Is that okay? Is everyone okay with that? Okay, yeah. Okay, I have to give the prize to Dwayne. 
Nice. That surprises me because because <laughs> 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 I've read uh, other minutes which I thought were much better. So it seems pretty clear here that Dwayne should just do all the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that is now. No, it does put the pressure on for next time because I think I'm next. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I don't have any secret uh, secret sauce. I just, I, I literally, I don't know. I take the minutes and then just uh, uh, in real time and then send it to Stephanie like 10 minutes after the meeting <laughs> and she does some magic on it. So I, that surprises me, Stephanie, but that's, that sounds good. <laughs> I've never considered myself a good note taker. <laughs> no, they're, they're consistently good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, Thanks, Stephanie. So let's open up to the public for comments. So Eric or Renee, if either of you have a comment, you can just virtually raise your hand. Okay. Eric, go ahead. You can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for your continued hard work on, on uh, helping to mitigate climate, climate change on behalf of the town and the rest of the planet actually. What I'm wondering is in um, the work uh, that has uh, preceding is preceding the guiding the solar siting survey that um, whether I think Andrea just touched on it very briefly whether a consideration a forward looking consideration of the in increased continuing increased efficiency of solar panels is being considered. I, that's all I, I thank you very much. I'd love, uh, I think um, I think in my last, I, I, I made a comment a, a couple of weeks ago regarding a National Renewable Energy Laboratory report that cited that Massachusetts can um, uh, kind of um, uh, deal with almost 45 to 50% of its electrical needs through rooftop solar deployment. Steve indicated those that was old data, but I'm wondering. But 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 panels are getting more and more and more efficient. I've had panels on my house since 2014, and I know that they're not the most efficient panels um, anymore. So I'm wondering whether in your metrics is it's a, there's a there's a way of including uh, the increased efficiency of the technology as we move, and I'm sure it is increasingly getting increasingly efficient very fast. Thanks, Eric. Just if I can quickly respond, I think yeah, right. uh, embedded in that, and, and I think um, what, what I can look at is whether the state projections for capacity uh, assumed any change in the efficiency of the panels, because uh, that, that, would, that, would, that would be important for us to know or know not, that it that it doesn't make any assumptions and, and then we can look a little bit in terms of what the uh, um, projections might look like in terms of greater efficiency great thank you very much and thanks again for your hard work thank you renee you can unmute yourself and go ahead hi ditto on what eric said in terms of thanking you all for your hard work um i just have one quick thing um, I'm, I'm wondering if you're also considering um, in the scenarios going forward about looking at this issue, not just as Amherst share, not just as what does Amherst need to do? Are we thinking about it at all in a regional way? Are we thinking about working with the other towns, with um, just being just... Um, looking at things just in a more regional way, because then we may have greater alternatives on how we can um, find more disturbed land or just maximize our capacity by working with neighboring towns. Um, so that's basically all I have to say. And my usual question, how many people were listening? There were four maximum and only down to three most of the meeting. Okay, thank you. I, I, I saw six, Stephanie, but yeah. That's... Oh, I don't know where you ever saw. I never had six. I only had four. That's and fine. then we had three. It was the same people. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, because I am I documented six. Yeah, okay. no, there are four. <laughs> thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you, Renee and 
Eric, for sticking around. Um, I think Renee brings up a good point. How do we partner with other towns? I, I don't know if that's something to consider. Um, I know the Shootsbury chair reached out to me and he was interested in being part of the education series. So what's he doing for solar? I, I don't know. I, I can send you contacts and I don't know if that would help at all, Dwayne and Steve, but it's a good point. Okay. That's all we have the time for. Um, thank you, everybody. We went 11 minutes over, but hopefully this won't happen again because we've gone over the meat of the slides for the four pillars. So we'll keep it uh, short and sweet, hopefully, uh, going forward. All right. Thank you all. Have Thanks, a good evening. Basu. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.